My baby dolls. It's the middle of September. We're looking at the end of September. Baseball playoff fevers in full gear. You are listening to Genesis. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz, and again, we're talking about classic baseball today, and you know how I love the obscure, the forgotten, and today we're going to be talking about power-hitting, awesome first baseman, Hal Trotsky of the Cleveland Indians, and if you don't know who Hal Trotsky was, well, it's an unfortunate uh, mistake by historians because playing in a, in a world where there's a Lou Gehrig or a Jimmy Fox or a Hank Greenberg at first, you can somehow get lost in the shuffle, and we're going to see why he was important, uh, not only to the Cleveland Indians, but also to Iowa and um you know, his uh, upbringing in the Midwest, in what I like to call the Wheaton Corn Belt. But uh, we're going to get to him in a second. We got author Bill Johnson on the show, and he's going to go talk about his fantastic book on Trotsky. And, um, but before we even get to them, uh, you are listening to the Comfortably Zone Radio Network with the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho, our fearless leader, our producer. We got so many shows coming out. You know, I had uh, helped bring Bill Cachetas to the network, and he has a great show, Philadelphia uh, Baseball, Past, Present, and Future. And not only do we talk about the Phillies, we talk about the uh, athletics, which still to this day um, have the most uh, pennants in World Series from that town in Pennsylvania. And he also deals with uh, Negro Leagues and also women baseball in the area. It's pretty much a Pennsylvania type of show. We got Mark and Mark in the midday, and we're talking about Mark Littell and Mark Weiss, and if you don't know who Mark Littell is, he was the guy on Kansas City that Whitey Herzog brought in in the 1976 American League Championship Series. Of course, I was six years old then, and my father woke me up after Chris Chambliss hit that massive home run. Well, it wasn't massive. It was almost caught. Uh, but, um, you know, sending the Yankees into the first World Series against the Big Red Machine in 12 years. We also got Peter Golenbach for Golenbach's University, and that's on every Sunday night. We also got Hal Bach, and he's on the show along with uh, George Case III and uh, Alan Blumkin and, uh, you know, Golenbach, another, another show on vintage sports history. And we got Nancy Finley, Charlie O's niece, who I was able to get for Oakland A's baseball. So the network's growing. You know, I usually do a show with Dave Nemec and Al Blumpkin on Dave Nemec's old-time baseball and trivia. Dave's just moved to California. He's settling in. I mean, he's 78, so he's going to be settling in for a while. So I don't know when that show is going to be picked up. But there's also Giants baseball, and we talk about New York baseball giants, San Francisco baseball giants. I I helped out uh, Ralph for a few months, but now the co-host is back. Like I said, go to the Comfortable Zone Network. You're going to learn a lot of stuff today. Our subject is Hal Trotsky. And you know some I knew of Hal Trotsky, and I knew about his legacy in Cleveland, but there is just so much more I've learned. We're going to talk about the crybaby experience. We're going to talk about headaches. We're going to talk about depression and replay baseball. We're going to talk about the great city of Cleveland. And you must be saying to yourself, Ian, you got to have rocks in your head because Cleveland is part of that rust belt. But you know something? In the late 20s, early 30s, we're going to learn it really wasn't, just like Detroit. Detroit was another major city that was up and coming before the Depression hit. And we're going to learn why Cleveland and Cleveland fans are just as rabid fans as any other, even if they did not win for a long time. And again, Trotsky played in an era where Tris Speaker had to resign uh, a few years earlier, in 1926. I think Trotsky began his career in 33. But they had success under uh, Speaker, uh, winning the World Series and in 1920, when uh, devastation hit the team, really, when Ray Chapman was hit in the head by uh, uh, by Carl Mays on the Yankees and killed him, uh, and of course after that, pretty much the dead ball era uh, pretty much ended uh, along with the Black Sox scandal, where you know it's turning night and you can't even see the ball because the ball looks like a head of cabbage and spits on it. God knows what else is on it. Uh, but the whole thing changed. Cleveland. If you do your history, had a rich history, even well into the 1950s. 
unfortunately, they were overshadowed by my Yankees. Uh, and, of course, the devastating loss in the 54 World Series against the New York Giants. But you know something? I've gotten an interest in Cleveland, not because of what's going on now, but because of the history of it in uh, baseball and how Trotsky is one that I want you all to remember. Now, who was Bill Johnson? Well, Bill Johnson was born in Kingsport, Tennessee. Love these Midwestern people, you know. He graduated from the University of California in Berkeley with a Bachelor's of Arts in Rhetoric and also earned a Master's of Aeronautical Science from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and a Master's of Arts in Military History from Norwich University. That sounds like me, just forever going to school. By a stroke sheer of luck, or fate, depending upon who you ask, he is married into the extended family of former Cleveland Indian slugger Hal Trotsky. So that saves me a question. Why would I, you know, what got you interested in uh, Hal Trotsky? Because he's related. From that emerged his biography of Mr. Trotsky, along with an abiding passion for baseball in eastern Iowa. He's written another book about uh, baseball in eastern Iowa. And, of course, a few people know the Field of Dreams is in Iowa, of all places. Uh, he has written baseball history for the Cedar Rapids Gazette, along with a local magazine. He has also contributed biographical essays that include Hank Aaron, That's Joy and Braveland, Bob Shaw, Go to Glory, the 1970 excuse me, the 1959 Chicago Whites, a huge team, huge. They stopped the Yankees of uh, continuous uh, penance. Spider Jorgensen, the team that time won't forget, the 1951 New York Giants, and of course, you see Bobby Thompson hit that home run. You see uh, Leo DeRocha just go bananas at third base. That had to calm down. I thought he was getting a heart attack. As well as the Society of American Baseball Research Biography Project, also known as Sabre, and um, currently, well, he was there in, uh, in Iowa. He just moved to Georgia. But let's welcome to the show. What's going on, Bill? Oh, delighted to be here. Good day, sir. Oh, how are you? How's, how's things in Georgia? You know, I mean, last night I was watching the Atlanta Falcons and that crazy new stadium they're in. It, it's a little toasty. It's nice that they've got an indoor venue because uh, there are times when uh, – like oh, um, I think come January, when there's no snow on the ground, I'll be pretty happy, but it's still taking some uh, adaptation right now. Oh, my God. I, I, my cousin lives in Winston, Georgia, and I'm just like, you know, when the temperatures reach 80 degrees up here in Boston, I'm just like sweating it out and the humidity. And But you come from Tennessee, which is above uh, Georgia, and, you know, the weather there is just as hot, isn't it? Uh, fairly, I came from the eastern part, up in the uh, the foothills, of the Appalachians, and so it's a little bit more temperate. So this is our real first introduction to actual uh, furnace-like conditions. Well, can I ask you some? What the heck made you move there? You're you're retired. <laughs> you're retired. What the hell are you moving to Atlanta? Why don't you just like go north, you know, and ca- catch a couple of like old age homes up in Maine, where uh, you know a lot of, that's where I want to head. Um, well, unfortunately, my wife said that she was moving to Georgia. Her job brought her actually down here, and we have a grandson in Florida, so uh, to be closer to him, and uh, it just made sense. Now, let me ask you, it's like I just said before in the introductions, you know, you're married into uh, uh, and you didn't know it. Now, how is your wife's relation to Hal Trotsky? Okay, yeah. Um, so the reason I, the reason that, as you said, uh, more succinctly than I probably will, that I wrote the book was because I had access to information that wasn't generally available. I had heard of Hal before I married my wife, but when I when we married, I didn't realize she was related. Her uh, her grandmother was Hal's sister, uh, Esther, and so maternal grandmother was Hal's sister. So she had a pretty decent personal knowledge of Hal growing up, but really she afforded me access kind of inside the tent as far as family records, pictures, all the stories, anecdotes, all those kinds of things that uh, that kind of fleshed out what otherwise would be just, you know, could be just another ball player. Now, you know, I love how you start the book, because I think that's how we're going to start here, really. Who was Hal Trotsky? And the answer depends where you really were. So let's explain that. Absolutely. To some, I mean, to Hal, to the people, the family, and the, those that he grew up with, he was just another Iowa farmer a, a lot of times um, who happened to have a prodigious talent for baseball. 
he grew up as a as an exceptional athlete, but most people, there was no starstruck character about him in Iowa. Whereas in Cleveland, um, as he came up as this kind of, they called him the Bohemian Blaster. He was a young, young guy, 22 years old, shows up and he's at first base in a position where it impacted, as you, as you noted earlier, by Jimmy Fox, Hank Greenberg, Lou Gehrig. There's not a lot of oxygen to stand out in the first base arena in, in that particular, uh, that era in the 30s. So, but he was a slugging first baseman. He had a couple of exceptional seasons, 1936 especially. Um, and then later in life, he was just a good family man, uh, interested in his kids, grandkids. His, he and his wife were extremely close until the day he died. Um, he was a pretty, in, in a sense, complex, multifaceted. In another sense, he was very consistent internally with, he was comfortable with who he was. And let me ask you this. Trotsky's uh, an American or an English name. His real name was Tro- Trojovsky. Tro- Trojovsky. <laughs> yes, um, Trojovsky is how the uh, Czechs pronounce it, the Bohemian. Yep, yep. And so let me ask you something. Like you mentioned, it was called Bohemia, which is now part of the Czech Republic and uh, Slovakia. And, of course, uh, the, uh, was it part of the sedate land, which uh, Hitler was, like, uh, raving and screaming about when he had to uh, annex it? Uh, I don't believe so. His family actually came more from, uh, and I, I'm going to butcher this name, Konigratz, which is now part of uh, Czechoslovakia, but it was the center of Bohemia. There were some, you know, the Germans fought over it in the 1860s, and, which is what actually forced the family to migrate to, to America. Um, but I don't think it was technically part of the sedate land, but I could, you know, I could be wrong. Let me ask you this. How does one get from, you know, that part of the world to, of all places, Norway, Iowa, when you have Ellis Island, you have Boston, you know, I know the Midwest is littered uh, with Middle uh, Eastern um, families who came here, especially Germany. Like, you go down to Cincinnati, and it's pretty much a German town. Same like, uh, you know, Wisconsin, you go up there, brats, I mean, Lambeau Field, I mean, everyone's cooking brats on the grill out there. How'd they get to Norway, <laughs> Iowa? I mean, it's true, when you think of it, huge, huge German populations out there. A- absolutely. The uh, the And this is a kind of a, a broad brush of how it happened for most, and then Hal's was a little bit different. Um, broad brush was uh, the immigrants would show up in the places that you identified, the embarkation points, the immigration points of the United States. Um, 1862, the Land Grant was pa- Act was passed offering settlers a chunk of acreage in the Midwest in this kind of unsettled, still Indian-occupied area, American Indian-occupied area. If they were willing to stay for 10 years, they could have the land outright and just continue to live. They wouldn't stay for five. They could purchase it at a reduced price. But with all these immigrants coming from uh, congested places, leaving for reasons of their own, including, like I said, the uh, the wars of the 1860s, 1870s with the Prussians, um, they came and they had the opportunity to go get some land and carve out an existence for themselves. Um, the Czechs, the, the whole Bohemia, Czechoslovakia, Germany, what is now that those kinds of areas, uh, provided uh, a huge number of families. And they came basically because their strength in numbers. The reason I think, uh, from my perspective, that so many are clumped in the Midwest is because once one went, they all kind of went. Uh, it offered them opportunity. At the same time, they didn't have to change and adapt to an entirely new culture if they had people with whom they were familiar. Well, let me ask you this question. His father, that was Charles, right? He tried farming. Uh, oh, sorry, John was his father. Charles was his grandfather. Yeah, Charles, his grandfather tried farming. Found it, you know, uh, he, he was better suited as a, you know, in the cobbling trade. And, um, you know, they, they, like you said, they moved here in droves. But what was his father thinking when you went out to Norway, um, Iowa? First of all, how the heck did he purchase a 420-acre farm? Um, his, his father, his, okay, Hal's grandfather and great grandfather had, 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 had first generations. They both, they, well, actually first and second, came over, and they had a variety of trades. They had tried farming, as you noted. Um, one ended up being a, a cobbler. One ended up being a brick maker. Um, John, actually, because he was part of not an affluent family but a successful family, was able to negotiate uh, a purchase of the tract of land. That they, the 420 acres that they end up buying, it was still Norway, Iowa. There were still Meskwaki uh, Indians roaming the area with some occasional conflicts. It was not a safe, benign environment. Uh, and he was willing to take it on, got it for a fairly low price, 
And he actually took up the farming and was the first Trotsky to really succeed at farming, Trotsky, to succeed at farming. Well, let me ask you this. I want you to describe the conditions of what each day was like. And then what struck me was, you know, the, the boy, um, Hal Trotsky, went to uh, St. Michael's Catholic parochial school. I didn't know they were Catholic. Yes, quite Catholic. Uh, it, it's kind of funny, the whole area. I I call it a devout strain of Catholicism, which leads to large large families. Um, his, he would get up in the morning, uh, roughly just before sunup, and then uh, there'd be a collection of chores. And they would take care of he and his sisters and brother, uh, would do the various chores. Then they would head off to parochial school, to Catholic school, which was pretty much the dominant, uh, the dominant school in town for no matter what religion, uh, you were. And then all day of that and then come home at night and they'd have the chores. Uh, as Hal became probably 10 to 12, he, he was, did a lot of time in the barn goofing around, uh, flipping up whatever he could find and swinging a, a, a any pole at it, or, you know, a rake handle, whatever. Uh, his sisters both played softball and actually played a little baseball in town. Uh, his father was not a baseball player at all, and he kind of resented the fact that Hal would take time away from what he considered serious farm work to be goofing off in the barn. But Hal and his sisters uh, gradually nurtured and honed his skills kind of in that private area. And then ultimately when the uh, town hall and the high school team started to, to pop up, the opportunities, he was in his size, he was a natural uh, fit for at least to get an opportunity to play. Now let me ask you this, because most of the baseball players of that time, and I'll cite Joe DiMaggio and Lou Gehrig, uh, as two of them, DiMaggio didn't, you know, his parents didn't want any of his sons to play. They never thought you could make a living, you know, playing baseball if you weren't in a factory or if you weren't in a farm field. You know, working, you know, it's pretty much playing, you know, all day. And I think Garrick, they came from a German uh, um, ancestry, and he also believed factory work, and, you know, education. Both families, I think, the, the Trotskys and the Garricks, uh, stressed education. Um, although Hal, I think, only made it to 12th grade, if I recall. Uh, yes, and you, I think you characterize it really nicely, and I never really put it in those terms, but thinking of farming in that environment then when you basically the success of your family or failure of your family is linked inextricably to the success or failure of your farm creates a certain uh, urgency for a guy like John Trotsky. So Hal's uh, time between farming and, and like you said, his, the emphasis on school, they really wanted their children to become, the boys to become educated, uh, really left a, very little space for him to, indulge in bas baseball and basketball, although he was obviously extremely well suited. He only ended up going to the 12th grade because the baseball opportunity arose. There was no, in the 30s, if you think about it, there were very few, maybe the World Series started to get some radio traction um, in the third, in the gas house gang era in the mid-30s, but for the most part, people read about baseball in the papers and it was a two-dimensional kind of pastime with a box score and then off you go to farm. So the idea of making a living or pursuing it at the expense of productive time that could be used, you know, growing the farm, doing whatever the chores, uh, it was it was really kind of considered idle, you know, waste of time, really. Let me ask you this question. When did Hal first become exposed uh, to, ba to do baseball? Did you pick up on any research where his love of baseball began and uh, when he really got interested in it? He actually, it was, it was actually a two-pronged thing. He actually started reading about, and this was the, the, the Yankees of the 20s, really kind of captivated his interest. And I think, and honestly, it, talking to family members, uh, Babe Ruth was always, as with every kid in America almost, was certainly the one that really uh, intrigued him the most, kind of tripped his trigger. And later in life when he got to play against uh, the Babe in his, his rookie year, it was it was one of the most memorable uh moments of his life and he would talk about it till his death but he would be he's aware of babe he was aware of the yankees he was aware of baseball as a career but also in the town and this is the the growth of baseball and the prairie construct the the massachusetts rules coming out to be these big town gatherings where as many people that wanted to play at a time uh in the 1870s 1880s kind of became more structured and into this more town ball concept where you play the new york rules standard baseball and again, at his size and his ability, he was really a pitcher initially, but he could also hit. Uh, he became very much uh, 
a target of interest for the uh, town itself. Why, you know, the whole thing of why aren't you out there playing for us against all the other neighboring towns in the region? Let me ask you this. In 1927, the Norway high school needed a catcher. Why did draft uh, Trotsky? What did he show? Because. That? Oh, yeah. It's a, well, it's kind of funny because it was the first and last time he ever caught. Uh, he had been playing again with his with Esther and Annette, his two sisters, in, in the barn, really, and catching them uh, because they, one of them was actually an overhand fastball, baseball pitcher, um, the older one, Annette, uh, and Esther, the younger sister, uh, she was she would, she would catch, but when she wanted to hit, Hal would be drafted to catch, and he would end up being. Uh, doing that for them for literally as much free time as they could hide from their father uh, within the course of the farm afternoon. With the town team called, it was an opportunity for him to play, and he really, I think he would have done just about any, played any position uh, just for the opportunity because by this time he was really intrigued by the game. He enjoyed basketball quite a bit. He really, really, truly loved playing baseball. And as a teenager, the notoriety, he was actually standing out in something. Uh, his father basically, uh, you know, looked the other way, said, go ahead. I'm not going to get a whole lot out of you anyway. You might as well play some baseball, um, which was kind of a recurrent theme for John Trayvosky's, uh perception of Hal's career as it got started. Well, let me ask you this, because, you know, picking up on the Catholic thing, and uh, how the heck did he go and did do pitching on independent teams on Sundays? It was Church Day Family Day. Did you find any research that, how he got away from his parents? That's a really good point. Um, actually, it came up because, you know, in the, in the Major League game, certainly the sun, whole Sunday baseball controversy had existed since the 1880s, 1890s. Um, there was less resistance to recreation on the, what, you know, the Sabbath at that point than there was – because it wasn't working just playing baseball, there was kind of this relaxed approach or, or – consideration of the thing as, yeah, go ahead and play, is that the rest of the town was coming up to watch and relax, so, but somebody had to do the actual playing itself. It wasn't a real stark fundamentalist interpretation of, uh, of uh, you know, no work on the Sabbath. So he has chewed base, uh, basketball because he was the tallest kid, and it would seem likely that basketball was gaining more steam at the time uh, because this what was created in 1890 uh, here in Massachusetts, and it did spread, especially through the Midwest, as we know with all these great basketball teams. And the 1920s were pretty much, uh, you know, uh, as baseball and football were gaining steam, so was basketball. But let me ask you this. Jerry Meredith and him, um, and we're talking about high school ball. They were able to uh, attract enough attention that the St. Louis scout uh, was on him. How did the St. Louis scout get all the way to Norway, Iowa? Absolutely. Jerry Meredith, uh, in terms of background for the, for the listeners, uh, was a exceptionally talented, kind of a Marty Marion comparable shortstop on the same high school, same town and same uh, town team and high school team with Hal. And, and they, to the other, they provided a, uh, a real unique challenge to the other high schools that played them. They were small enough; they never won the big tournaments, uh, but they were very. Those two were extremely competitive. The St. Louis scout, uh, and back then, scouting for a, for an organization, the whole budget for the year might be fifty thousand to one hundred thousand dollars for the entire nation for whatever scouting and signing needed to happen. But the St. Louis Scout was a regional. It was four hours north of St. Louis. His territory was Iowa and I believe Illinois. And that's where he really focused. It wasn't an assigned territory. But he had heard of Hal and Jerry uh, Meredith based on some other uh, interactions with other teams and coaches, repu that reputation type things. So the St. Louis Scout shows up, says, "Hey, maybe we could put you at uh, Danville." Um, Illinois, if we sign you, Hal didn't know what to do. Uh, he ran off. The only guy he knew in the whole area that had played Major League Baseball was a guy named Bing Miller, who was part of Connie Mack's 29 to 31 Philadelphia A's juggernaut that won a couple of World Series. Um, and he went up and talked to him, and, and Bing Miller said, "Hey, I know I know who you are. I've, I've actually uh, heard a lot about you. Just have a seat. Don't do anything with St. Louis until Connie Mack, until I can tell Mr. Mack, and let him have an opportunity to talk to you." And at the same, and then that afternoon, Hal drives back literally from Vinton, Iowa, talking to Bing Miller and the A's, and shows up. And Cy Slapnica, who is basically a legendary scout within the area, is sitting at his dinner table with his father and a uh, and a relative, 
And he's actually got a contract with him, and he puts it under Hal's nose and says, here, we'll send you to Cedar Rapids, play a low, you know, basic entry-level professional baseball. If it doesn't work out, there's no cost. If it does work out, uh, we've got an opportunity for you. But he really, literally within a period of maybe two weeks, he ended up with three scouts or three professional opportunities organizations talking to him about coming to work for them. And you know what's interesting when you think about it? Because Branch Rickey, I believe, was on the on the St. Louis uh, office staff at the time in the uh, mid twenties, and he, you know, did the concept of the minor league balls that um, all these uh, major league teams should have uh, minor league teams, and I think St. Louis was on the uh, on the big scale of it. But my thing is this: if he would have went with St. Louis. Do you think he would have made the majors? Because a lot of people didn't want to go into the St. Louis uh, farm teams and stuff like that because you get lost in the shuffle if they're only going to go for the best and the brightest. Well, you have, you know, X amount of players there. Do you think Hal Trotsky would have uh, prospered under St. Louis? That's a really interesting uh, uh, what-if type of question, speculation, because you know, ultimately Johnny Mize ended up playing a lot of first for him a few years later in health, the same would have been house prime. Uh, whether or not he would have succeeded within that entire organization, I don't know. I think one of the things that really helped Hal in the early, early phases, because he was, this is a kid, a big kid, a man child, but still a kid. Uh, a lot of the self-confidence issues, am I good enough? Is this right for me? Am I, am I, costing my family and my father the opportunity to work on his farm just so I can go do this. The fact that he was able to start in Cedar Rapids and play in, you know, the three Mississippi Valley League and, and right, stay local uh, was extremely useful. And I think that psychologically made him more viable for Cleveland going forward. And then Cleveland had a strong demand signal for a strong power hitting first baseman, whereas St. Louis and the Gas House Gang may never have, have really needed him. He might have been stuck for a while. Now, let me ask you this, because this is interesting. He goes to, he goes to Class D, Cedar Rapids, and, if, and they were called the Bunnies. Now, if anyone uh, doesn't know, Cedar Rapids is in the state of Iowa. Um, let me ask you this. He starts with a $65 monthly salary, but he has an odd way of, of holding the bat and standing at the plate. What the heck's going on with this hitting cross-handed stuff? Absolutely. So picture – taking a left-handed stance with a normal left-handed uh, hand position on the bat and then reversing it to a right-handed stance, again, with your left hand on top instead of down below. Um, that's how he learned to hit in the barn, again, back in his family, grow, with his family growing up, because like a fungo, he would throw the, you know, acorn, bottle cap, whatever, up and take a swing at it, and he just naturally put his left hand on top, and that's how he made it all the way through high school, and performed again well enough to draw some uh, some professional attention. When he got to Cedar Rapids, uh, he was quickly. The, the, you know, Cy came out watching him, and one of the observations is, "Hey, you need to switch and try left-handed hitting." He had always looked at the ball. His entire perspective was a right-handed hitter. Yeah, they switched him as a professional to the left side of the box and kept his hands in the same spot. And it turns out, and I don't know what the athletic savant equivalent is, but he was able to pick right up and become an extremely effective left-handed hitter, lifetime 300 batting average and the whole deal, and just based on the uh, judgment of the talent evaluators around him in Cedar Rapids. Now, when he made the change, how did he move from Cedar Rapids to Burlington? Uh, they basically, well, Cedar Rapids, they – he had started out as a pitcher, and for a variety of reasons, uh, he wasn't terribly effective as a pro. They told him to get a first baseman's mitt. He did that. Yeah, he could still hit. Um, Cedar Rapids basically ended up, I believe, with them. I think that they cut him, and he signed with Burlington, or they traded him. I forget. I'm not. A, I, I apologize for not being exactly clear on that. But within the Midwest, within the Mississippi Valley League at the time, there was a lot of uh, interaction um, between money and players. It wasn't the. It wasn't like the minor leagues today. It was a lot less formal. They were in the depression, uh, or getting on the you know just the early stages of it. There was a lot of movement uh, to keep teams afloat. Now you know what I found ironic, and I'll throw this tidbit out. Now Trotsky played 52 Mississippi Valley League games that summer. Like you said, he was converted to the uh, first baseman, and in 162 at bats, he managed 49 hits, including three home runs for a 302 batting average. That was his lifetime batting average in the majors. 
Yeah, it's a it is it's an extraordinary uh, story, I guess. The, the explanation he was just meant meant to do this. This was something that's an organic gift. It wasn't you know growing up in the barn and throwing hitting bottle caps and acorns is all fine and it, it makes for a nice mythology. But really, the fact is the man could flat out hit a baseball. That was his superpower. <laughs> He just he wasn't a terribly good pitcher. He became a better fielder later in life, but he could always, always, always hit. And once and later in his career, when he couldn't hit any longer, that was when it was t- he decided it was time to go home, even though he was still fairly young. Now here's something. Now he's going from Class C to Class B. He's in Quincy. Now where's Quincy located? I know it's a Quincy, Massachusetts, but but where's Quincy here? Uh- yeah, Quincy, Illinois. Um, it's right on the Mississippi River at kind of the confluence of Iowa, Illinois to the, to the east, and then Missouri to the south. Quincy's right down there near Keokuk, south of Burlington, um, definitely south of Dubuque. It's a, that whole, and this is now the Three I League, by the way. I should point out it's now Class B ball, uh, so it's a little more serious. Um, but it's all in that kind of area. Again, I really feel like, honestly, looking back, that keeping him fairly close to Cedar Rapids was one of the things that enabled him to have the confidence to take the leap forward when the opportunity came. Now, what happened was um, he goes to Toledo Mount Hands, and that's where Cleveland called him up, and uh, of all dates, September 11th, 1933. You know? yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, here we go. We got some history here, right? But you know what was going on at the time? King Kong was in the movies at the time, I think, uh you know, uh, you had a lot of stuff going on, especially with the Depression. Roosevelt was just uh, president. And now Trotsky uh, was earning $200 a month with the Toledo Mud Hens, which, again, is big money back then. Um, so he was called up by Cleveland. How do you do that, Dad? Uh, his call up with Cleveland initially, um, gosh, he, was, he struggled mightily at first. Uh, he had one particular game against um, the Yankees in which he went, 0 for 4, basically, he had, I think, uh, 12 or 13 swings of the bat. It was all strikeouts. It was it was just not good. It wasn't until uh, a, a couple of games in, about a week in, when he got an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, against the Red Sox, and he finally logged his first uh, major league home run off uh, Gordon, Dust, Gordon Rhodes. And he did it in front of the Bay, because that is one of the memorable games he was uh, he would be noted for. Oh, yeah, that, that game with the Bay was so, again, anyone that ever spent any time with Howe would tell you that was always the first story he told. And, in fact, he kept the, – the, the basic construct, if you don't mind, real quickly, he's playing against the Yankees uh, early on as this young kid, 20, 21 years old, um, and the Babe gets a hit. He's on first base. Uh, Gehrig is coming to bat. And, and this kid is there holding his idol on first. He's at the base ready to play the position appropriately. Babe says, look, uh, if you're here and Gary gets a hold of one, he'll take your head off. Why don't you back off, just take a little deeper uh, deeper position? I'm not going anywhere. And he, like the Babe, like how he used to say, I ain't going anywhere, Keed, like the Babe used to do, and, uh, and t- save your life. Babe didn't take off. Gary did hit a rope, um, but – Again, Hal was never, ever, ever short of praising Ruth for his kindness to this young, basically trembling rookie uh, up in Cleveland. Not only is he in the presence of the Bay, but he's got Gary at bat. This is the major leagues. He's actually playing against the people he's read about for all these years. And now one of them is telling, look, <laughs> I'm going to help you out here. I won't go anywhere. It was just kind of that brotherhood thing, but Hal never, actually, never ever forgot that. And, you know, he did pretty good. Uh, for the month of September, because um, they wouldn't they wouldn't win uh, the pennant. I believe the Tigers, but Mickey Cochran won um, that year, if I'm not mistaken. And they lost to the, the uh, Gas House Gang in uh, the World Series, St. Louis. But he did bat 295. He had a homer, that homer uh, with the Babe, um, a double, and two triples, and drove in eight runs. Now let me ask you this before we even get into his full season. What was the city of Cleveland like at that time? You mentioned it in the uh, pre, and I really appreciate the opportunity, your prologue, your uh, the narrative you provided because it really was a different place. Cleveland today, oh, and certainly in the seventies and eighties, was more of a punchline than anything. But back in the twenties and thirties, it was one of the great cities of America. John D. Rockefeller, uh, the founder of basically the petroleum industry in this country, had his he was headquartered there, and he had these glorious grounds. Uh, several locations in the town. It was a high society, high industry area, 
extremely profitable. If you drove through Cleveland today, say in a neighborhood like Shaker Heights, it might appear a little bit, which is toward East Cleveland, it might appear a bit run down, filled with, uh, you know, less, you know, higher crime, et cetera, et cetera. At the day, in the day, it was high society, uh, in the upper Midwest, and Cleveland was absolutely a, a, a bedrock place to be. It had the Lake Erie, the Commerce, the shipping magnates all had offices or residences there. But again, Rockefeller was the big, was the shiny star, and he drew a lot of uh, attention and, and people to the area. Now, 1934, pretty much his rookie, his, his rookie season, his whole season, what a year for rookies, and he only finishes seventh. <laughs> What's going on when he hits 330, 35 home runs, and 142 runs? For all, you know, even triple crown winner Lou Gehrig wasn't better than uh, fifth. What was so special about Cochran that uh, season? Yeah, well, you, the, 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 if you look at the numbers, and, and you know, you, it's hard to compare numbers across eras, but if you look at Trotsky's numbers in 34 to compare to, say, someone like Mike Trout's rookie season, except for the stolen bases, they they hold up quite competitively. Like you said, a great, gaudy, glittery numbers in terms of power and average. Um, but Lou Gehrig won the Triple Crown and couldn't even win the MVP that year. Uh, the, Mickey Cochran, back in those that day, the the kind of the uh, the standard for performance for most valuable actually was linked entirely to the success of your team. And Cochran's Tigers were the best team in the American League, and he got the nod. He was Mickey Cochran is one of those people in the, the history of the game that I feel like is a little bit under uh, appreciated, maybe not understood as well as as he could be because he was such a dynamic leader. Player and he played catcher for a, the Tigers team that battled the Gas House Gang. He was a really tremendous player. His numbers weren't certainly weren't Garrick numbers because Garrick won the Triple Crown, but they weren't even Trotsky numbers. And yet he was considered the most valuable player in the league. Yeah, I got a show coming on on the 34 to 35 Tigers about Detroit, about that secret society that was like the Ku Klux Klan that ran around the city. Oh yeah. Yeah, they were the black. Uh, Knights or some, and I forgot the author. He's going to kill me, but uh, Tom Stanley, I forget his name. He's going to be on my show, um, and I learned a lot about Detroit. Like I learned a lot about Cleveland. Cleveland was a major city. You know, all this became part of the Rust Belt during the 1970s when, you know, the economy was just, you know, flat broke like it was 10 years ago. So both, you know, what I like about these books like yours and, and Detroit, you get a sense What's going on in, in the city now? Let's talk about Cleveland's municipal stadium again. Back then, the dimensions were weird. You know, this was a huge, <laughs> cavernous stadium that held what seventy thousand people. I think it was huge. It was, it was huge. But they used to build the dimensions of the ballpark uh, to abut the street uh, corners and stuff. So you'd have a center field like an Ebbets Field of what four hundred ninety feet, and you'd have a right field post of like two thirty five. <laughs> What's going on with oh, the Municipal Stadium? Absolutely. Well, up until 1932, the, the Indians had played exclusively at, at what was called League Park, and there were actually three versions of League Park. Uh, one had burned down back in the early 19, the first decade of the 20th century. Rebuilt. It was a very tight. It was almost a bandbox. The right field fence was 295 feet away. It had a, a 30 foot concrete, and then uh, fencing up the top of it to keep the balls off, again, like you said, within the city block, Lexington Avenue. And they played there exclusively. In 1932, uh, Albert Bradley and the team opened up, built and opened up Municipal Stadium right there near the water, near the lake, uh, much closer to downtown. And, and cavernous would be an understatement. Like you point out, the uh, the dimensions, it would hold over at one point over 80,000 people, and no one ever hit a ball out of the park under its original dimensions to straightaway center. It was that big. Um, eventually, over the years, they would move the park in, the, the fences in, uh, but it's still, for the decade of the 30s, from 32 on, the, uh, the Indians played some of their games at uh, Municipal Stadium and some of their games at League, depending on the, if the Yankees were coming to town, they would try to play at Municipal Stadium. If they were playing, say, the St. Louis Browns, League Park would still – it wouldn't fill up. It only held like 33,000, but they would have trouble selling those tickets. It was really a function of being able to provide capacity near the downtown. As you point out, municipal center that was thriving, that was absolutely bustling downtown. All that shipping infrastructure and all that that rusted out in the 70s was actually in work and producing huge profits for the uh, community back in the uh, the mid-30s. Now, let me ask you this. His sophomore year, 
you have a huge decline in his average, in his runs scored, in his home runs. What, 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 what was happening with him that he had this slump? He was married to his uh, sweetheart over there uh, a year before, and thir- uh, two years before, I think, 33. Things seemed to be going well with Trotsky. What happened in 35? It's an, that's an interesting, it is, like you point out, the classic sophomore slump. He was happily married. He had married this girl that actually, Lorraine Glenn from Norway, Iowa, where the original town is just west of Cedar Rapids that they were both from. She was a, she was a wonderful student. She was a nurse. She'd been to college. She was everything that he wasn't in terms of education and class and, and, you know, civility. Uh, and so, but they were very happily married and then Hal had this monstrous 1934 rookie season. For a variety of reasons, and none of which have really been pinpointed, he lost 60 points in his batting average. He went from 330 to, I think, 271. He still drove in 100 runs, but um, and hit, uh, what, not even 30 home runs that year. But uh, for whatever reason, he had some mechanical issues that got in his head that he started trying to overthink. And at the same time, his defense was really coming under harsh criticism from the local media. Guys like Franklin Lewis, Whitey Lewis of the uh, – the uh, plain de- not the plain dealer, the Cleveland News were just beating him up, calling him overrated. He's not the next Gehrig, et cetera, et cetera. So he's getting this from the local press, and it took its toll. He was 22 years old at the time, and it kind of took its psychological toll, I think. So how did he get the, the alligator skin to come back in 36 and have the season of his life? Boy, isn't that the million dollar question? How that happened? He, because even in spring training of 36, he had picked up basically right where 1935 left off. Uh, he was not playing terribly well under, well under the expectations set. The bar was so high from his 34 season that he was already, uh, coming under some scrutiny. Now they did go, Walter Johnson, who had been managing the team, they let him go and they brought in his manager, a guy named Steve O'Neill, who had been a catcher back on that 1920 World Series team that you talked about earlier. But he had managed Hal in the minor leagues and they had a very good relationship. And Steve O'Neill basically had Hal break down his game into components and, and worry about individual pieces that he could control. We'll work on your defense today. Take your easy swings and all these kinds of things. And all of a sudden, out of the gate, a little stumble for the first week, and then he took off. And he ended up having a 1936 uh, one for the ages. He drove in 162 runs, which is still, I think, the 20th biggest total in, in baseball, his major league history. He drove in 405 total bases. Think about that. That's an, a remarkable number of bases. If you look today, very few people uh, crest 360, 370. And he had 96 extra base hits. The number of people in a single season that have had more than 90 extra base hits, it's, it's, pretty, it's a surprisingly small list. But all that came together at age 23 uh, in basically what you would call a crescendo of his career. Now, let me ask you this. Now, his RBI total in his first three seasons were greater and the totals amassed by Garrick Fox of Greenberg over their first three years in the league. How come we don't get any attention for that? Um, I think uh, I think you just have, just nailed the uh, answer to the question. It's uh, you look at those names, and again, as you point out, DiMaggio in '36 has now arrived on the scene, and yeah. he's providing New York with yet another tool um, in their arsenal, another weapon in the arsenal. But those the, those three names, Fox, Greenberg, and Garrick, basically dominated not only the media and deservedly so. But the All-Star, the All-Star game had just begun a couple of years earlier. They were the selections based on who was having the better year. They were far better known. Uh, Hal Trotsky was a young kid from Cleveland who had splashed but hadn't ever really exceeded the level of performance of those guys. Um, I like to say, again, it's one of my, there just wasn't enough oxygen in the tank for all four first basemen to have that kind of notoriety. So as well as Hal played, he was never selected uh, to an actual All-Star team uh, for his entire career because those three players were so much, so very dominant and dominated the headlines. See, that's what happened with Hank Greenberg. You see, he was scouted by the Yanks because he grew up a few blocks away from Yankee Stadium in the South Bronx, a dominant Jewish family. And he said, I'm never going to be able to play first base. Yeah, Lou Gehrig. And so what happened was, um, you know, Detroit, uh, his uh, contract sent them down south. And that's when he first experienced uh, anti-Semitism. It's a very interesting read if you ever wanted to read uh, uh, Hank Greenberg, Hero, Heroes of Heroes. Um, it's written by John Rosengren. Uh, but similarly, like Trotsky, he knew he was playing in an era of first base. Now let me ask you this. 
I like to call this the calm years, the years from 1937 to 1939, the era of good feelings, whatever you want to call it. Things were relatively good both on the field and off the field for Trotsky. What's going on here? Yeah, in 1936, he and Lorraine had their first uh, child, a boy, Hal Trotsky Jr., um, who would actually go and pitch a couple of games for the White Sox in, uh, in the late 50s. Um, and then they had another son, Jim Trotsky, uh, a little bit later. They were domestic bliss had really set in. Hal was very comfortable in, in his own skin with who he was. He was driving in a hundred. He drove in a hundred runs uh, a season for six years in a row. Um, his batting average. <laughs> well, kind of funny. The team had. Uh, had decided that at some point within that that span that you know you needed to hit more how we'd like you to hit for better average um, don't worry about the power so much and so he worked very hard on going the opposite field he was a dead pull hitter up until 1937 and he started 37 38 um, he started working on going to the opposite field he ended up actually in 1938 raised his average uh to 334 for the season a 35 point jump or 36 point jump over the previous year his home run total went down, and so he took a he actually took a pay cut at the end of the season. He was hitting better, drove in 100 runs, but only hit 19 homers in 30, 1938. And so uh, <laughs> the team actually, Alva Bradley, cut his salary, um, which it's to kind of sent him back to the old approach of I'm going to be a little bit more of a pull hitter for the next few years. But for the most part, those three years, um, the team was okay. There was always the Yankees were on the probably the most historic stri- uh, span of dominance. We've ever seen in the game, the 36 to 39 Yankees were as good as any team. I would put them against any team, including the 27, the mid 20s Yankees. Um, and so Cleveland was never going to crack that nut. Uh, but they played okay. They played enough to get fans out to the ballpark and how continue to do his thing. Again, laboring in some anonymity because of the competition uh, surrounding his position. Now in 1939, we know that Trotsky becomes captain. Gets paid a little five hundred dollars extra, which again, you're under the reserve clause. You're at the mercy of mm. the owners, okay? But now we have a very fiery um, manager in Oscar Vit and Trotsky. Where did Trotsky get the notion that he felt that he could be like what you called here a buffer from some of the rookies and younger guys between them and Oscar Vit? It's interesting how Oscar Vitt, when he was signed, they fired Steve O'Neill for team again. They couldn't because they couldn't surpass the Yankees. Um, and eight teams in the league, in the American League back then, there just wasn't a lot of margin for error if the team ownership felt that way. And the team ownership was a different story entirely with Albert Bradley. But they fired Steve O'Neill and hired Oscar Vitt. Vitt had been a uh, a kind of a utility man back on some of the mid-1910s, 1920 Tigers teams with Ty Cobb, Sam Crawford, some of the really aggressive, tough players. Um, and he had the opinion that that was the best way to, to perform, to get a team to do well, was to yell it, like Huey Jennings had back in, back in his Tiger days. Now, Vitt had had a lot of success as a minor league manager with Newark. The Newark Bears in 1937, they were the Yankees, what would be roughly the equivalent of a triple-A team for the Yankees. They, they blew the, the International League away. I don't think they're, I think they won by 25, 20 or 25 games. And, and Oscar Vitt came into the Cleveland job with uh, not a halo, but at least a, an air of uh, authority in that you trust me, I'll get you to the promised land. He immediately started implementing the same managerial tactics that he'd, uh, had, that he'd played under uh, 20 years earlier and just started beating the heck out of uh, some of the players psychologically. Guys like Feller, who was you know, six or seven years younger even than Hal, Trotsky, um, Mel Harder, who had been an accomplished professional, uh, Willis Hudlin, a really successful pitcher, he just started in on these folks. Trotsky, at least, even at age 26, uh, had the wherewithal to be, to stand up and say, I'm going to take the reins, I'm going to take the team leadership, I would like to buffer that. And so he actually started intervening with with Vitt, and Vitt made him captain because he felt like he could look at Trotsky in the eye, and if he yelled at Trotsky, Hal didn't take it personally. He just took it and moved on and kind of shared the criticism with some of the youngers. And for a while, that that actually worked. He was a pretty effective buffer early on. Now, at the same time, I'd say, like, really coincidental, we know what was happening to Lou Gehrig at this time. You know, he had gotten sick. He had been diagnosed with ALS. You had the uh, I'm the luckiest man uh, speech. But at the same time, coincidentally, headaches start to come. 
uh, to Hal Trotsky. And I know the doctors could not find the source of it, but is there any indication through your research that it was inherited migraines or was it a, uh, you know, uh, coming from breathing the air or uh, whatever it may be that was causing these things at such a young age? It's, a, it's an excellent question. It, uh, basically, as you point out, with Gehrig on the wane and uh, the conditions were evolving where Hal at age 26, 27, normally extremely productive years for a player, uh, just a normal career, he actually, his performance began to ebb. And a lot of it was because increasingly, and it's still not to the point of debilitation, which he'd reached in the 1940 and 41, but to the point where the headaches with the migraines, would, the spike in the eye, have to lie down, those kinds of things till it passes, really extremely severe debilitating pain. And the doctors would, would check him, and they'd try a cure, and it wouldn't work, and they'd try another option. That would fail. And for a long time, until in fact, until the 1940s, uh, he really never had an, a sense of why he was getting these headaches. Eventually, by 1940, 41, he would have to pull himself from games. He would, as he noted, at one point, he was at first base taking a throw from the pitcher, and the ball came toward him, and it looked like just a, a loose ball of feathers. He really couldn't even find the center of it because his vision was so impaired uh, by the migraine, the, uh, the symptoms and the, the, the qualities of the migraine. Um, and ultimately, that would kind of force him out of the game for a while. Um, he just never was able to overcome that. It turns out, ironically, that it wasn't so much family-related as it was a manifestation of, of what today I guess we call lactose intolerance. He was They were dairy-related uh, headaches, and once he got off the dairy products, they went away. For the, in fact, he never had a problem the rest of his life after baseball. Um, and I, the ironic thing is he's a dairy farmer in Iowa. That was his livestock. He would have some ground that he would work, and he also had cattle. And he would, as a dairy farmer, to get migraines from the product that you're producing was a little bit of a cruel irony for him. And unfortunately, he never figured that out. He did not figure that out until it was too late in his uh, playing career. Now, let me ask you this question. Now we get to 1940, and, you know, the stuff going on in the major leagues. In, in 1940 on the Cincinnati Reds, they would actually go to the World Series and win it um, that year. Uh, one of their players committed suicide. Um, so, again, you know, from, uh, echoings of the dead ball period, you know, where a lot of players, it was a very difficult and hard sport, were killing themselves because of the psychological effects of the game. But now you have Cleveland. And now Vitt seems to have gone too far. Now, this is, this is a very interesting thing. Now, we, we know on uh, June 10th they were in Boston, okay? And they're willing to put the blame on uh, Vitt. Now, they're planning a whole coup, uh, coup, and Trotsky, again, he's the captain, he's trying to calm the team down. He's like, hey, you know, we don't want to be pointing anyone or being whistleblowers or being known as uh, such and such. But yet the next evening... After the Indians were blown out, he speaks with Frank Gibbons on the Cleveland Press about this whole thing. He did a, he did a double take in 24 hours. What's the point? <laughs> 1940 is, is one of the most, to me, one of the most fascinating seasons in Cleveland Indian history. That team, we talked about earlier how the, the 36 to 39 Yankees just they made it impossible to compete. By 1940, as you point out, with Gehrig retired, um, unfortunately, but it offered – there was some opportunity, and Cleveland and Detroit actually both had exceptionally talented teams. Cleveland, for for a good part of the season, had been competing at the top or in second place in the standings and looked like with Feller and Harder and, and Willis Sutton, like I said, excellent pitching, excellent offense. They had – all the cylinders were firing in some sort of, of unison. Really good team. But uh, the, as you point out, with uh, the manager did not – he didn't appreciate it in the way that the players, I guess, felt it should have been appreciated. Instead of congratulating, he, he motivated with a whip instead of a carrot. He would yell louder and louder any time that there was any any slight failure in, in his to meeting his standards. Uh, that would just take it out on the players, and including, like I said, some of their stars like Feller and Harder. Um, and the players, as a group, were, had some had some personalities in there that were a little bit uh, feisty, and they had decided amongst themselves that maybe the best way for them to ensure that they could win this year with that good team and the Yankees out of it was to another manager, that they needed another manager, that Vitt was not the right guy. And so Hal actually, like you said, confided to Frank Gibbons, 
Um, and Gibbons basically said, hey, you know, you probably should wait and don't do anything stupid uh, right now. You're in the middle early season, but you're still competing quite well. Don't do anything. Um, and then uh, it reached a boiling point a little bit later, uh, and then the, the team leaders, Hal, Mel Harder, a few others, had met with basically the entire squad on the train. On these long train trips, they had the opportunity to have these kind of meetings in a, in a kind of a cone of silence. Um, and they decided that they were going to go to the owner, Al, Al Vitt, and say, Mr. Vitt, we can't win with uh, Vitt. We'd like you to – Albert Bradley, I'm sorry. We can't win with Vitt as manager. Uh, would you consider replacing him? And that meeting was supposed to go down uh, the day before. Hal's, Hal gets a telegram that his mother has passed away in Norway, in Iowa. And so he gets on the next train and leaves town. The other players go in to the, to confront Vitt and say, or confront Bradley and say, look, we'd like to have Vitt out. And Hal is on the phone saying, yeah, that's, uh, we think that's best for the team. Uh, the word gets out. And we don't really know how we assume that Bradley leaked it. Um, it's really not known, but every, every reporter in Cleveland and thus the national press, everyone gets a hold of the story. And, and they go from being a competitive, a uh, team of high integrity people to being considered, you know, called the crybabies, uh, the crybaby Indians of 1940. For the rest of the season, they were, they, every part they go to, they were pilloried. They would have baby bottles thrown at them, pacifiers. Fans would show up wearing diapers and baby bonnets on their heads, you know, the hostile fans. Um, even in Life magazine, or Look magazine, there was a picture of three of the Indians with superimposed baby clothing on them calling them the crybabies in this national publication. It was a really an awful scene that the season ends up. The Indians lose to the Tigers by two games, or, or by a game, actually, and then the Tigers actually went on to play the Reds in the World Series. Now, let me ask you this question. What was interesting, and what I want to stress is, these weren't just kids, uh, you know, making a coup against, you know, a school teacher. These were all seasoned veterans who, um, you know, like you mentioned, they, they all worked in the off-seasons. They all pretty much had families. They knew they, they knew the consequences of what would happen if they, they struck up this coup. And yet they went ahead with it. And it, like you said, Hal gave his blessing, but he wasn't there because his mother had passed on. And the media, uh, you found in your research, made more of it that maybe Hal, you know, wasn't part of this whole thing. Yeah, it's, uh, because of the, I mean, as we talked, you know, talked about earlier, you weren't necessarily paid extra if you performed well as an individual. You really earned your money based on winning. And this team of, as you point out, fairly accomplished professionals, and not all of them indigenous Cleveland homegrown products. A lot of them came from other organizations. They were mature men. They knew what they were doing, getting into, at least they thought they did. But they truly actually believed that Oscar Vitt was the impediment to success. Um, rather than a facilitator, and it was that important that they take this step and go to the ownership and have them and sh- consider the possibility of removing and replacing him. Um, Hal was part of the part of this decision process as a team leader, and he would never shirk that. But he also he was not the one that said we should go into the office this morning. That was done actually after he left town to go to his mother's funeral. She had li- literally died, like, like I said, the day before. Um, there is some question as to whether or not Hal was really seriously part of believing that they should storm the storm Bradley's office and make those demands immediately, or as Frank Gibbons had told him, maybe you should wait a while and think this, do some more strategizing and think this through and see how things uh, progress a little bit. Now let me ask you this: this is, you know, this is real interesting. Through it all, you know, um, you know, I think he remained on Vit. Um, even though, um, you know, the whole Cryberry B uh, incident happened. Now, 11 years later, the Cleveland News, in doing their uh, investigative reporting, found a memo from Alva Bradley. And uh, what, what did that say? Because that was real troubling. Yeah, 11 years later, uh, they uncovered Bradley had, uh, I believe he had passed away, certainly had left the team. He'd, the Bill Vec had bought the team in the interim and it, I think sold it by then. And going through Bradley's old records, they found a memo. He had actually conducted an internal investigation. And as he wrote in the memo, every charge the players made, and they had gone through a litany of accusations of that he was too, uh, his tactical decision making wasn't good. He was uh, unnecessarily harsh on young players. Every accusation they made, Bradley determined actually stood up. It held up and that they were accurate and that 
uh, the team and they came to him, they weren't exaggerating. They were telling the truth as, as best that they knew it. And then as Bradley discovered later, um, he agreed with everything they said, which was pretty damning because he never did pull Vitt. Uh, he waited till the end of the season before he finally got rid of the manager. And by that time, it was too late. Did you, unco- did you uncover anything why he would have kept Vitt? Um, cynical me, I, I, I'm not – a big fan of Alva Bradley's manage, or ownership style. He was an incredibly successful businessman. He uh, came into some family money, but he did a lot with it. Um, owning a baseball club in Cleveland made him part of the society. Like we talked about earlier, this kind of higher society in Cleveland. He had a number of friends in industry throughout the, the Midwest. Um, but he was never invested in it as a baseball man. He would tell. He told Cy Flatnica after he fired Bobby e- or Billy Evans, um, and made Cy Flatnick one of the very first general managers with that title in, in the history of the game. He said, I don't, I don't really know very much about this game. I need you to take care of the baseball stuff. And then when they re- require someone like a Bradley to take action, he found himself kind of paralyzed um, with indecision, in my opinion. That's, that's my opinion. I have no documentation of that. This is based on my read of uh, everything that I've seen to this point. Now, in 1941, Again, the migraines are getting worse, and he breaks his thumb, and he says, hey, this is it. In 42 and 43, he goes home, and he farms. Now, do you have any recollections, or, or anything, not, well, not recollections, but recollections through memos or notes? How was he able to farm, fish, and hunt if he had these terrific headaches? Um, so, yeah, actually, the arm, he had actually, in 1941, he broke his, like his boy down, he broke his thumb. He, he had pulled himself from several, from a, a road trip and from a number of games. Um, Oscar Grimes had stepped in and substituted first base. There were a lot of times he was just unable to play. 1942, Pearl Harbor has happened in December of 41. Hal tries to enlist in the Army. They declare him 4F, uh, unsuitable for military service because of his migraines. He uh, petitions for a, he appeals. Um, they uphold their original judgment, saying, nope, you're simply not capable uh, of doing a soldier's work because of these documented history of migraines. Uh, the time away from Cleveland, and I think, I, I don't know if it's a function of rationing or whatever, but for whatever reason, the headache started to ebb a bit, and he found himself able to productively farm. He was, he was actually pulling in, I think, 80 bushels of corn an acre, which at the time uh, was pretty comparable to the professional farmers, the year-rounders. He worked for a while at the Amana Refrigeration because uh, Roosevelt had sent out this worker fight dictum, either you are in the Army or you're working in the war effort. And Hal had no problem with that. Um, but he was actually able to function in society to the point where by 1944, when uh, Jimmy Dykes and the White Sox come sniffing. He's actually feeling like there might be a possibility that he could strap him on again and give baseball another try. And you know something? He didn't do too bad in '44. Um, you know, I think he led his team in home runs. I think he had what ten of them. Um, Trotsky homered in nine different parks uh, and off 112 different pitches during his career. Um, I love this. Tommy Bridges and Bump Hadley, they were his most frequent victims. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. After, you know, after 1944, he said, hey, I'm going home. You know, this is, this is done, you know. Uh, he's going to await either draft or whatever. He's going to support the war draft. And he gets, and he gets, you know, he goes and he gets a job in a refrigeration uh, plant. What's going on here? Yeah, 1944, when Jimmy Dykes and the White Sox, this is wartime baseball players. You had Pete Gray, players, a lot of players that might not have been playing otherwise um, had to play because so many of the, the major league regulars were off uh, in various parts of the services. Um, and he plays with the White Sox and Ralph Hodgen, who I interviewed a few years ago before he passed. Um, but he was a real nice guy. He Ten home runs in Comiskey Park back then before they moved fences in at Old Comiskey was a pretty spectacular number. Um, even though he only had 241. But then 1945, he, he says, I'm just not good enough. 241 is unsatisfactory. So we went home to eastern Iowa to Cedar Rapids and then to Norway. And Amana, like you think of the old Amana radar ranges from the 60s, well, it's the same Amana. And they Amana refrigerators were a big commercial deal. They were just beginning to re, receive national distribution. You could buy a home and get an actual Amana electric refrigerator. He was working in their plant. Again, in this whole worker fight, um, he had the opportunity. They needed him. He needed the job. So he went off, and, and he did that for a while. 
And then in 1946, Jimmy Dykes asks again, would you like to come play for us? He came and played for him. He played even more poorly than he had in 1944. Then all the regulars were back. 1946, the servicemen came home, and that was that became Hal's last year in professional baseball playing. At age 33, uh, between the headaches and the uh, the age and everything, he just decided that that was it. It was time to go home. But you know something? It didn't end for him with baseball, and I love this part of the story. He managed the semi-pro team, the Amana Freezes, which, again, they were um, sponsored by the Amana Refrigeration, the factory that he um, worked for. He um, he also became a scout um, for the White Sox between 47 and 50. He traveled around and, and, and got to know... Um, you know, looking for the next himself, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but he also, he also, um, you know, um, did it. But he, was he involved with the NFL as well? I think because um, with football, I think uh, it's mentioned somewhere here. Uh, but Jack Dittmer, I think, and and uh, Hall of Fame Emlyn Tunnel. Uh, something was going on here. Yeah, that was it, it was an interesting time for him after he decided to go back. Like you said, he scouted. He had a great relationship with the White Sox, um, probably better with the organization of the White Sox than he actually did with the Indians for a long time before they finally reconciled. But he was a White Sox area scout in the Midwest. Um, he managed that same Amana refrigeration where he worked in '45. They had a uh, what was it, an amateur team playing in the National Baseball Congress tournaments, and they'd pull in players from colleges and, and high schools and. Good amateurs that had not signed professional contracts yet, and he actually they asked him to coach in 1947. That team included Emlyn Tunnell, who's at the University of Iowa. Emlyn Tunnell, future NFL Hall of Famer in the defensive backfield, but he had him and he had Jack Dittmer, who played for uh, Milwaukee for uh, several years uh, in the same team. They actually made it all the way to uh, the basically the national level, the final round of the tournament. Um, before they were defeated. It was an exceptional team, though, and they actually played some of the – there was a, a Manufacturers and Jobbers League, a semi-pro industrial league in Cedar Rapids at the time, which had some ex-major leaguers and a lot of ex-minor leaguers, and they played that team uh, on a couple of occasions and beat them. It was, a, it was a really good team, and it was the only time Hal managed, the only season that he seriously managed, but he enjoyed the heck out of it by all accounts. And, you know, he goes back, and um, I think he passed away of all of all dates. Again, another historical date, June 18th, Paul McCartney uh, from the Beatles' birthday, you know. <laughs> this is great, oh, wow. you know. It's like, it's like all these dates. It's just because I know everything about every date. And, again, you know, my favorite group, the Beatles, he died. Now, let me ask you this. He had heart problems for a while, right, before he died of a massive heart attack in the kitchen? He did. He was – of an era, an age, and a time when you know, diet being what it was for cholesterol, family history was not good for living for a long life on the male side. But he had had several heart attacks in the mid to late 70s. Um, one of them, he had he, he scared the heck out of his wife. They were living in an apartment in Cedar Rapids. He was out. He, the car was stuck, and he was he, at age 70. What was he? Seventy something. He was or 69. He was trying to push the car up a driveway at the apartment in some snow. And he actually collapsed behind the car and had a a relapse. His wife thought he had actually expired at the point. Um, She made him, and they made him uh, promise to behave, to back off from those kinds of things. But in 1979, uh, it all caught up with him. Like you said, on June 18th, he was literally in the back of their apartment, two-bedroom apartment in Cedar Rapids, and his wife was in the kitchen doing dishes. She heard a a crash. She raced back, and, and he had massive, massive heart attack. He had died basically instantly. Um, there was no chance of resuscitation, and at that point he was gone. Yeah, he was – the doctor said he uh, died even before he hit the floor. Yeah, they, they said it was it was instantaneous. I mean, he literally, like, the, the fall, by the time he fell, he was already gone. I hate to say it, but if I'm going to go, that's the way I would want to go in a flash. But let me ask you this very important question here. Why isn't he in the Hall of Fame? Hank Greenberg played nine years. He's in the Hall of Fame. Had similar numbers. Again, his his uh, career was cut short for four years in service. But um, why isn't Hal in there? I think, I, honestly, I believe, and I've talked to a bunch of the family about this, because that question does come up, and, and half the family believes he should be, and half the, says, well, probably not. And I think the best argument, I, I emailed Bill James about this a few times, and I kind of subscribe to the idea that it was it was – 
not because it was a short career, but because it was just a little too short. His productive years from age 21 to 28 were outstanding. Had he been able to hold on for three or four more good years, especially or a couple of good post-war years, I think the discussion might be a little more serious. But uh, six, you know, six straight seasons, driving in 100-plus runs, lifetime 300 batting average. He never made an all-star team, but for reasons like we've discussed, that there wasn't a lot of room. There was a fixed number of spots. Um, he played on a team that never won a World Series, never even played in a World Series, for again, for reasons we discussed, the Yankees were so good and Tigers. Um, there were a lot of mitigating things. It was an exceptionally wonderful career, but it was a little bit short, um, and that's probably, I think if Howe were here today, he would say that was the reason he shouldn't really probably be considered for it. Now let me ask you before I end the show, did I fail to mention anything that sticks out that maybe you would want to mention uh, about how? Um, well, I, I will say the only thing, I, I, back to your initial question, you know, who was Hal Trotsky? Again, his playing career is a matter of record, um, and his hopefully the book has exposed some of this, the family stuff. But I really feel like everyone I've ever talked to, and it's not because they're starstruck Iowans. They're, they're actually a pretty tough crowd to impress with a lot of this uh, celebrity stuff. But those that knew him really genuinely regarded him as a good man. Um, and he did all these – he lived his life. Yeah, he wasn't defined – didn't define himself as a professional baseball player. That kind of defined, defined him by others. But he really saw himself as a good Catholic man, father, husband, first – and everything else second, and I, that really continues to impress me. There's a lot of people in eastern Iowa. If I were to talk to him right now, like so many there that have played baseball at major league level, and, and they will talk about anybody else but themselves, there's a natural uh, reluctance, a, a honest humility, and I think he had that. I really do think he was probably an exceptional guy, and I really wish I had a chance to have met him before, uh, before he passed. Yeah, that would have been something, you know, because a lot of these baseball players, they always have a – Great story to tell, even in the stuff that's not written or documented. Exactly. You know, they can tell you the stories that's off the record, uh, as we see in so much baseball history. Well, I'll tell you what, I had a fantastic time today. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about how Trotsky. I know the folks in their car or at home or in the office, they're going to learn about uh, how Trotsky. How'd you find the show? I really appreciate the opportunity. I would love talking about how, um, and I, but I've really. Uh, as we spoke earlier before the show, your knowledge of this stuff makes it very easy to just kind of jump on in and start uh, rambling until I, I need to stop. <laughs> so I well, you, you know, this is what we're going to do. You're going to hold the line. Uh, we're going to get you back to the show probably, probably in November, December. We'll talk about Norway, um, Iowa baseball, and baseball in the Midwest because I always love um, how different geographical zones I mean, it can even be worldwide. In fact, I had a podcast uh, two years ago where I needed a translator because I called Italy. And uh, this guy started the uh, Tomato League, uh, which is very small in Italy because, again, soccer is the big thing. And I held a podcast where I needed a translator to find out what's going on because it was pissed. <laughs> so I love baseball. Anyway, hold on to the line. I'm going to end the show. Folks, I hope you had a good time today. I know you could find this um, – you know, Bill in uh, McFarland and Amazon. Where else can we find the book? Um, basically, all the online aid books, Barn Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Uh, McFarland is the primary publisher, though. They're the best place to start. You know, folks, I can't begin to tell you how much I've enjoyed reading about Hal Trotsky. You love baseball history. You love the Cleveland Indians. You love learning about uh, a time period in ball, which I still think is pretty much the golden age of baseball. Go out. Get this book, Hal Trotsky, uh, Baseball Biography by Bill Johnson. Um, let me know how uh, you guys like it. Always drop me a line. Again, I'm Ian Kahanowitz. You're listening to Genesis. Thank you, sir, for being on the phone. Thanks a lot to Bill Johnson. Again, we're signing off from the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And in the immortal words of Edward R. Murrow, good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you next time.